appropriate. I feel like there would be some. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's workshop meeting scheduled for Tuesday, October 18th, 2022 at 3 p.m. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Present. Ms. Cassell. Here. Mr. Bolston. Ms. Johnson. Present. Mayor Petrolia. And here, and we have work, we have several, three workshop items. So we'll start with uh, the first stop, wor workshop item. I think we have one other, yeah, we have four actually. Um, uh, with the uh, Kaiser Group. Hi there. Good afternoon, Andrea Kaiser with Kaiser Legal, 55 Southeast 2nd Avenue, Delray Beach, Florida, 33444. Uh, and in advance, happy Halloween to everyone. Today we're here to um, submit, uh, make two requests for sponsorships for text amendments. Um, the first one is a sponsorship request to, am to amend the regulating plan to consolidate this property into a civil single subdistrict. The address is 306 Northeast 2nd Street. The land use is mixed use commercial core and the zoning is CBD. In 2001, this property was unified pursuant to a declaration of unity of title prepared by uh, the city attorney. And um, in 2015, regulating plans for the railroad corridor subdistrict and the central core subdistrict were adopted pursuant to ordinance 0215. So probably unbeknownst at the time, the property is unified into a single parcel, yet when the regulations were adopted, the northern portion of the property is in the railroad corridor subdistrict, and the southern portion of the property is in the central core subdistrict. So today we ask for the opportunity to present to you a text amendment application um, and to provide justification why it's um, important to correct this error, error, so this way this property is subject to one set of development standards and not two different set of development standards. Um, in the regulating plans for the railroad, uh, for the subdistricts. The second sponsorship request is relate in relation to amending the LDRs to allow five stories and 54 feet in the northern portion of the railroad corridor subdistrict. On March 2nd, 2021, the LDRs were amended to allow the same five stories without exceeding the maximum 54 foot height restriction in the southern portion of the railroad corridor subdistrict. And when you evaluate your code um, for the railroad corridor subdistrict, the code says is that this particular area is intended to upgrade and expand existing uses. And your comp plan also tells us that we need to find ways to promote housing supply and meet the residential demands. So in this subdistrict, there's a lot of smaller parcels um, that would benefit from the five stories without exceeding the maximum 54 foot height limitation. Um, it's important to note that no increases in density are being requested, and due to the smaller size of these parcels, even with a fifth story, you still wouldn't be able to reach the maximum um, density allowed and permitted in this subdistrict. Also, neighboring buildings to the east and the west and the north um, fall in the range between 50 and 60 feet, so it would be consistent as um, this property is kind of a transitioning point from the central core subdistrict into the railroad corridor subdistrict. So we think this um, expanding this to the northern portion of the railroad corridor subject would greatly benefit the properties in this area due to the smaller parcel sizes. Good. Anything else? No. Okay. Just um, ready for questions. Do we have any? Um, we don't have anything that's going to be coming from the city with respect no. to this. No. This Unless is just you have privately initiated. Okay. Very good. So to the commission for discussion. Ask a question. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. Hi, Andrea. It's good to see you. Um, Afternoon. Regarding the height, I, sure. I believe that this parcel and the proposal is next to Ocean City Lofts. Mm -hmm. Is it you're seeking to have the same size as Ocean City Lofts? What they built? Ocean City Lofts. So, um, let's see. Yeah. Just to the. You mean the southwest? Southeast. Or southeast. I think it's like right That's southeast. Well. I mm -hmm. think you're right. South. Yeah. I mean, it's right next to it. <laughs> yes, right next to it. So, yeah, so we were we were measuring the buildings within the area, and, and the buildings in the area fall anywhere between 50 and 60 feet. Okay, so if what's being sought is the same as what Ocean City Lofts did, did they get a waiver, or? I'm, I'm unaware. Okay. I, I'm happy to look like it up Anthea. and get back to you. Anthea, super yeah. Anthea. <laughs> <laughs> she might be able really to answer that. Lady. So, first of all, um, 
I do take issue a little bit with the concept that this was an error, so I would like to put that on the record if I could. Um, because before 2015, there was a whole different zoning district for the railroad corridor district, and it was put together as a sub-district, and no zoning was changed at the time, and simply buying property and unifying it doesn't make you get a rezoning. Um, under the previous conditional use process we had downtown, there were ways to go um, above up to 60 feet, I believe, in height. The bonus, the bonus it was it was it was like a bonus um, in height and also in density for the purposes of providing affordable housing. That was in place at the time, and I'm I'm, I'm wondering if that's why Ocean City Loft is a little taller, perhaps. Um, there were certain it was two separate um, incentives that were in place, and I'm not sure if the height was related to workforce housing. I know the density was at the time. Um, and they were allowed in certain areas. So um, that's, that's kind of where that came from. So depending on how this goes, would it be possible to get that information? I can, and um, I do wanna bring up one thing as well, just in case you ask me a question. <laughs> so in 2015, we did a difference where we started um, assigning a number of stories as opposed to simply height. And I'm trying to remember, the mayor, I know you were on the commission at the time, um, and we were not even going to put a height limit. We were simply going to define the stories and you had four or whatever and the, and the, and the focus of the time was trying to attract more Class A office downtown, which typically needs taller ceiling heights, make it really easy to do cool loft um, units, things like that. And then I think we kind of lost our nerve at the last minute and we still put that 54 feet mm -hmm. and four stories, right? It had to do with also height. pancaking, if you remember. And that so was the issue. Right. And because before we had people, we had 48 feet and they were, didn't want to ask for the conditional use anymore because they knew the community didn't like the extra height. And so they were, you know, trying to squeeze them in. We're getting low ceilings. And so honestly, this is the difference in the concept. Mm -hmm. When you snap a chalk line and say, this is the height, no matter what, you're going to you, this this is exactly what's happening, right? Is that no? Oh, well, but five will fit. Yeah. When really the goal was to allow, you know, uh, maybe a more varied village by the sea skyline. Yeah. So that's how we got to all of these places, um, and we just look forward to seeing where you want to go in the next era based on uh, Ms. Kaiser's request. So thank okay, you. very good. Thank Anything you. else? Yeah. Okay. Thank Anyone? You. Yeah, Commissioner. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Johnson. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I really am appreciative of this um, discussion because. We, we seem to not have a real good understanding. I met with um, the developer, and there's a promise of four stories, and it won't be five stories, but we're going to put something on the top. And it's just, I know we're not discussing the project itself because there's no concept of what it's going to look like. I'm just very concerned that now we have buildings that are right on the sidewalk. There is no distance. It's just, it's just you're there. You walk on the sidewalk, you might as well just walk into the door. So I, I still am not getting a very good understanding from, where did she go? Anthea. Yeah. You're hiding. There you are. <laughs> I can't see you from there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I don't know if this is going to be another workshop. Did this just talk about what's four stories? You're going to have a, a nine foot ceiling and you're still four stories. And I appreciated that. Um, slide that you put up mm -hmm. because you could have a four story and be 72 feet feet high 54 well right. no, I'm saying I'm, I'm right. exaggerating okay um, but that's exactly what happened that's why we put the ultimate cap in yes it's exactly that concern and now we're cramming them in right but my main concern is in order to be uniform if we've allowed these others, whether it's a waiver or an exception or whatever, um, bonus plus, whatever, I'd like to see perhaps this happen in order to be uniform. I don't think we can say you're restricted to three floors, whatever, because we've allowed these others, but I don't know if this is the way we need to do it. Do we say you come in with a waiver, like perhaps the others did? The bonus program may no longer be available. Uh, again, we're not talking about the project. I'm just not always in favor of changing our our yep. LDRs. Thank you. Got it. Uh, Commissioner Bolston, anything? No, but Anthea, if you could just walk me through uh, the... You, you're, oh. I think your mic's off. Sorry. If you could just walk me through the beginning of this presentation where it just talks about a little bit of the history of these two properties being tied together and what that means. That's, yeah, I'll let Ms. Kaiser do that. <laughs> 
So it's interesting when we pulled the title search for this property, this didn't come up, but we did find that the parcel was unified back in 2001, and it was done by the city attorney's office here in Delray. So it was already a unified parcel, yet when the sub-district uh, regulations were adopted 14 years later, it split the property in two. Um, you know, we presumed it was an error and maybe it was not, but at the end of the day, two different sets of development standards are being applied to a property that's considered one unified parcel, and that's very confusing um, and difficult. So we wanted to appropriately unify the parcel into a single subject district because it's been unified since 2001. We have lots of parcels that do that, though. Sunday Village has multiple. That was going to be my follow-up question. And, and you can work it out. In this case, it appears, without me being able to do the research, that it's the parking that is on the skinny stri strip that's yeah. tied to the other parcel. So that's that's all the parking that must be supporting the development that's on the central core thing. And there's nothing that precludes that from happening, you know, without changing the district. Now, if you have an appetite for raising the density in an effort to bring those affordable housing requirements in as part of this change. That is part of what this would do. Um, if both the change in the, uh, in the map and the proposed LDR amendment came through. Sorry, Ticketary. <laughs> However, I mean, it, it is an LDR amendment, so it's not unique to this, which means the northern part of Railroad Corridor would go to five stories and I'm assuming you're asking for the density too. I have to go back. No, and... we're not asking for any increases to density. You're just keeping it at 30. Yes. So okay. No density. Okay. Changes. So the bottom one is got the really the 80. I don't remember the number we just adopted. And five stories. This would have five stories, but stay at 30, or this would go to commercial core. Would you're coloring this pink or this yellow? That's what's existing. So existing, the bottom one is Central Core Pink, and the top one is Railroad Core District. And you want Public. both to be? In the Railroad Corridor District, but that would be our, you know, and then, the application we would put okay. forward. Okay, and then change that district to allow five stories within the height instead of four. Well, it would be applicable to the, all of the Railroad Corridor District. Okay. So just like it is in the southern portion, it's permitted in all of the southern portion Railroad Corridor, then we would ask that the northern Railroad Corridor District enjoy the same um, number of stories and height as the southern portion. So this impacts much more than just this one parcel. That's part of why it comes here. Um, and it's not just like a right. scrap action. And that's yeah. biggest concern. Um, and, and that's an, actually an important part of the analysis because our argument is, is that the reason why it would be beneficial to this district is because if you take a look at the size of the parcels, they're smaller parcels. And if you want to have, a, if you want to revitalize the area and you want to have a better mix of uses, it's a small parcel. You can only do so much on that parcel. So having a fifth story gives, you know, property owners the ability to provide more mix of uses without without exceeding height restrictions, without exceeding densities permitted, and they're able to do more on those properties. So it would be beneficial to the district as a whole. Meanwhile, I have, I have three or four new buildings on third. I have three or four new applications poised to go to Sprab on third that are operating well below the, the height limit in, pl in place now. So we are seeing the result of that um, new uh, street scape effort that the commission um, just completed. I think we're gonna have a groundbreaking soon. It's done everything that those investments are supposed to do. You're gonna see a number of new new buildings coming in on north on third, not on second. Right. Third. And then and then also just you know the the enjoyment that the southern portion of the railroad core district enjoys that the northern portion doesn't. So that's why we thought the railroad corridor, di corridor district would be the appropriate district to make that request because it already exists in the code and it would just be more consistent. Mr. Boylston, are you still asking questions or are you good? Almost said, thank you. Okay. Um, Mayor, can I you? just clarify something? Sure. Um, Ms. Kaiser did allude to the fact that about this unity of title, which I just pulled up. So it's not, it wasn't just done by the city. So it's, it was prepared by the city, but her client or whoever the former owner was, they actually executed. So I don't want the impression to be that this was like a unilateral, you know, city initiated action. It's, it's a document that the city completes all the time, but it, you know, I, I, when I heard this, I just got the impression that it was being alluded to, like the city just, you know, filed this document, but it was actually whoever the prior owner was at that time. So I just gotcha. want that to be clear. Thank you. Yeah, point noted, and that wasn't our intention. We just wanted to simply know since the office prepared it, they were aware of it. Okay. Um, um, Mayor, the city never owned any of these parcels. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, 
Mr. Cassell, I mean, uh, Deputy Vice Mayor Cassell, anything else? No. Okay, no. Vice Mayor, anything? Oh, you okay. already did, that's yeah. right. You. you know, I, I'm not gonna support the, the five, store, five um, levels. Um, I come from where we were having this issue where it's, it is a pancaking effect. Um, it doesn't look uh, good from the outside. We, we went through a lot of uh, heartburn um, in the past uh, on, this, on this commission, prior, prior to most of you here. Um, and uh, chose that uh, we were going to give the, the the height and the limit of four stories. I, I think that that fits Delray. Um, with respect to the um, not getting enough in, well, that's that's what the rules are. I mean, that's why we have rules. Others are as a city, uh, um, or I'm sorry, uh, Anthea explained. Others are doing um, exactly that. I don't see um, there being a benefit to one end. Only, I think that there are rules in place. We, we chose to go in the south section and do something a little bit different to spark um, some, uh, you know, uh, some additional, I guess, uh, development there. Um, but I'm not willing to move it um, all the way up the corridor in a text amendment uh, type style and then end up with, uh, I think, what will look inferior to what we actually have on the books right now, which is four stories and the 54 feet. Um, the unified parcel, I'm, I'm not really understanding how we could unify a parcel across a street. Um, understood if it was uh, adjacent to it, but there's a, there's a, there's a street. Uh, there is an actual complete delineation of one parcel to the next. So I see them as, as very separate. I don't see them as being together and unified. You, have, you don't have the ability to be able to do a building completely from one from one side of your parcel to the other side of your parcel, even if it is unified. So it's different, it's distinct, it's on the, the bottom um, half of that, uh, that road, the south, south of the, that, I don't, can't, can't even see what road it is, second? Second road, so, second street. So um, I'm, not, I'm not in favor. And I don't know what we, we, we won't be voting, correct? No, so it's just, um, Ms. Kaiser would need one sponsorship um, one commissioner to sponsor her item in order to be able to move forward. Um, I would encourage um, any applicants that if they do obtain a sponsorship to listen to the comments from the other commissioners who may not be in favor at this point. Um, so that if they do decide to move forward, you know, there's kind of an understanding of where everybody stands. All right, so does uh, Ms. Kaiser have a, a sponsor moving forward? Seeing no one. I would have to tell you, unless, are you going to be sponsoring? When we started the sponsor thing, I, I honestly was just thinking I would sponsor mainly anything just to give someone an opportunity to present, right, and to hear those ideas. Um, but after our last meeting, there's a consensus here. It hasn't changed mm -hmm. yet officially, but there is a consensus here to support staff and the many things that are, you know, stacked on them um, to not have to work on something that doesn't have, have the support. So. Um, you know, in the past, and I think in a you know, conversation that we actually had earlier, um, you know, I've been all for being, being that sponsor, but there's kind of a change here, and we have to be supportive of staff in, in prioritizing things, and I'm not seeing that this has, you know, I'd like to see five votes when I sponsor something, you know, you know if it has three, so I, I can't step up and sponsor this one. I think, I think we've kind of made a decision as a group. Okay. Right, and this is a discussion we had recently to say if one person sponsors, there's, it's highly unlikely that you get to the end. And in the process, we engage our staff and we put a lot on them when all we get are, you know, people saying the process moves too slowly. So it's no offense to the project, but if, if you don't feel like you've got full support, you're not going to get to the next level. May I, yes, may, may I have um, Lynn tell us? What are the new rules after this? I don't even know how this particular item got on the workshop agenda. So, so out of fairness, this has been requested. It was requested a long time ago. Um, we typically do these uh, sponsorship meetings quarterly. However, during the budget process, we had to push it off because that had to become the priority for the five of you. And so Ms. Kaiser had this in the, in the hopper for a long time, and she was very patient and understood the delays. So even though we have the direction from the commission and we're gonna be working on that LDR change, because right now, 
the code says you only need one sponsorship, go forward. we, you know, and, and that's why I'm encouraging people to read the room, right? Because again, it's what Commissioner Boylston just said, you may get a sponsor, but if there's four other people that are highly against it, it, there is a, a significant fee that's assessed in order to start the application process. And unless something very different is going to come forward before the commission, you know, it, it may not be the best use of resources. So at this point, um, this will probably be the last workshop that um, has the one sponsorship requirement. We are working on that LDR change. Um, but at this point, um, anybody who's on this agenda today only needs one sponsorship. Right. Going forward, it's, it's going to be different. Very good. Okay, I, um, I wanted you to explain it too. Commissioner Blasal, you chose? No, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm probably the reason why Ms. Kaiser is here, because we spoke, and I supported her presenting. I support people coming in and presenting, and then us having this discussion before we engage our staff. I think that's a good way to do it, and I do think it, it will be more helpful when we say three of us have to. But I have a question. I was told that the staff has already been engaged. I don't know how or what. In this particular case, maybe you did some preliminary work. Is that not true? You haven't been before in Thea? No. Or the, no. No, not at all. Okay. Staff has done no work on this other than to prepare the agenda and okay. put it before we, you. Uh, just uh, full disclosure, we did have some conversations with a, a planner that was previously employed here about you know, the pre-application meeting. Thank Understandable. You. And you know what? I think it's a great opportunity to be able to make sure that you're not spending a lot of time, energy yourselves and money um, on something that isn't necessarily going to be, a, um, you know, supported going forward. So it just, it makes this, a, I think, a cleaner process. And also it's fair to, I think, uh, the applicants and it's fair to, our, certainly fair to our staff. All right. So moving on. Thank you very yep, much. Thank you very much. Um, work, workshop item two is, this is for the, um, privately uh, initiated text amendment for um, multi-communal housing units. Hello. How do we use this slide? Ah, got it. And is that the only item? Because there was an executive summary. Can I hand these out? Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Tanya Kushakjian, CEO of Breakthrough Strategies. Uh, you can call me TK for short. Um, I'm here representing my client, Jetta Investment Company. Dr. Kurt Jetta, uh, the CEO, is here today, along with Mr. Eli Johnson, Director of Operations for Jetta Investment Company. First, I want to thank the City Manager and Development Services team for their guidance and advice in this process, which I understand is now moving or changing. Um, so first, just want to let you know who is uh, Jetta Investment Company privately owned investment firm based here in Delray Beach, Florida, uh, focused on investing in and providing clean, safe, well-maintained, and affordable multifamily housing here in Palm Beach County. Um, and specifically, we're here before you to seek your support for a cool, new, and truly affordable housing concept that we are calling micro-communal housing units, or MCHUs for short. Uh, I think we all uh, see and know that there is an affordable housing crisis here in South Florida and throughout the nation. There's a great demand for affordable housing, for, especially for vulnerable sectors of our, of our residents. Uh, disparities in wealth and wage seems to have gotten wider, especially during the pandemic. Uh, and real estate investments tend to dispro uh, disproportionately cater to high income earners due to higher profit potential. This is the opposite of uh, what I'm going to be proposing as far as MCHU is concerned. Uh, of course, current labor shortages uh, only exacerbate these problems and has led to an increase in homelessness uh, here in Delray Beach and throughout Palm Beach County, uh, which has the potential to hurt small businesses uh, here in Palm Beach County. As you may know, nearly 26% of Palm Beach County lives at the 35000 a year income uh, threshold or less. Uh, that's about 300,000 people across the county. Uh, MCHUs are a proven affordable housing option for underserved and I would argue overlooked segments of our community, uh, which has little to no negative externalities. Uh, it's also an attractive investment opportunity for local investors uh, and can have a positive uh, impact uh, on social and economic challenges here in Delray Beach. Uh, and here's the kicker, no government subsidies or tax breaks. Uh, typically government subsidies, um, whether it's a HUD loan or, or other types of Section 8, uh, comes from the taxpayer. This doesn't 
have a burden on the taxpayer or any small businesses. Uh, it's purely uh, economic driven, but also provides a social uh, social uh, service. Has a low carbon uh, footprint uh, with a communal design of bathrooms and, and kitchens, uh, smaller carbon footprint and lower building costs, increased tax revenue, reduced homelessness, as I said. Uh, and the residents here can uh, be in the 10 to 20,000 annual income range and afford these units, which is about 500 to 600 dollars per month. I don't know how many people you have coming before you that want to build uh, apartments for 500 to 600 dollars a month, but um, I would argue that we're probably one of the first in this climate and uh, we hope to, to, to continue that trend, uh, not just here in Delray, but throughout the county. And of course, we're committed, uh, Jetta Investments uh, is committed to well-maintained units that will improve living standards of residents and add values, uh, add value to the surrounding communities. And of course, our objective is to seek um, the LDR. So if I could point your attention real quick just to go over what the ordinance does in a summary. Um, it's in the handout in front of you. Um, it does reduce the parking requirements to one space for every two units where an MCHU is um, authorized. Data shows, and we're happy to share that data with you um, should we have the uh, pleasure of a support of one of your commissioners uh, to move forward to have this discussion on affordable housing here in Delray Beach. Uh, but the data shows that the majority of the current residents uh, do not own cars, um, so this actually fits. Uh, proposed density restrictions based on zoning, 24 units for single family, 36 for multifamily, and 48 for mixed used areas. MCHUs are not permitted in any other districts. Uh, only 0.2 acres needed in multifamily districts, of course, with the proposed parking amendment that we're seeking, uh, and requires no less than 75% of the applicable lot size in a single family home zone. Uh, requires one month minimum lease, so limited state uses such as Airbnb are not per permitted on MCHUs. Uh, uh, requires annual licensing of property managers and approval by the city. Uh, we want to make sure that there is proper oversight, uh, that you as this commission and future commissions will have that kind of oversight. Um, as you can see, we've kind of uh, done a lot of the thinking uh, for you as much as possible. Of course, we're open to your questions and comments and concerns and incorporating those in uh, our plans uh, as we seek to move forward. Um, and of course, we've also put in a 1,000 foot distance requirement between uh, MCHUs. You don't want to cluster them up in one, one particular uh, neighborhood and we're cognizant of that fact. And so we've put, built that into the uh, LDR. The benefits, affordable housing. Um, I don't think uh, you, you have a shortage uh, of, uh, or that you have a surplus of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Increased tax revenue, clean and safe living conditions, and of course, reduced uh, homelessness. Uh, we do have some support for the concept. Uh, Delray Housing Group uh, here in Delray Beach, uh, letters of support that have been shared with you all, uh, Delray Beach Chamber of Commerce, the Palm Beach County Homeless Coalition, uh, the Spady Museum, uh, and just this morning we received a letter of support from Gulfstream Goodwill Industries who we're looking to partner with um, not uh, throughout Palm Beach County as they are engaged in affordable uh, housing uh, and we hope to, to, to work with them in that regard. Uh, so at this point, um, I normally end my presentations with a quote uh, because no matter what you're trying to say, someone probably has already said it better. Uh, so I will leave you with this, quote, the city can do with the upper, very rarely does it do with the middle, but none of our opportunities are for the lower, low, low home property owners, homeowners, et cetera. We just don't consider them because it's not feasible, it's not affordable. That was Commissioner Johnson at the commission meeting on June 14th uh, here in Delray. Madam Mayor, distinguished members of the commission, this is your chance to do just that. Um, so I hope to have your support. Thank you. Thank you. That was not fair. <laughs> I was going to tell you. <laughs> I was going to tell you. I'm not so sure I agree with that quote as I was listening to it. Uh, but anyway, I'm sure it was taken out of context. There you go. I, oh, it was a yeah. dis it was a discussion on affordable housing that was initiated by Commissioner Cassell. I got you. Well, I I've done my homework. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to the commission. Anything that the um, city wants to add, I guess not, right? Because we're still over the private text. Okay, so to the commission. I actually think Anthea does want to add something. Oh, does she? Okay. Yeah. Come on up, Anthea. I do. I have to go to the mic. Mic. Yeah. <laughs> you have such a beautiful she voice. A I don't know why you don't want it. So this this whole way we're trying to do this, I know we're, we're working on it, but it is strangely awkward because I'm always like, oh, um, I should tell them something. All right. So I just do want to be sure there was a draft ordinance submitted with this application application for your review and I'm not sure whether um, 
you guys had a chance to look it over. Um, you know, to be clear, this is not units. This is a co-housing arrangement um, where people would share bathrooms, kitchens, there's a property manager, two, um, two people to a room. Um, but in terms of if the goal is truly affordable housing, just um, to note that the ordinance puts this in every single district, including the single family districts, um, limiting no more than uh, 24 private rooms in a single family district, which at two people per person is 48. Um, this is the last page of the ordinance under density and distance. Um, multi-family 48 rooms at two people per room it's 96 right it's it's pretty intense in terms of the way it's drafted this is what you said two people could be in a room you're saying 36 private rooms two people per room is 72 so these are the things that if this is going to achieve sponsorship perhaps we should weigh in on and if we're truly trying to afford um, provide a workforce housing or affordable housing it's a one-month term that's in this draft as well was that a minimum one more month yes minimum right. which conflicts with our transient housing standards yeah. and if we're trying to provide a solution shouldn't it be at least on par with standard housing right. um, so um, Lake Worth Beach I think got a similar proposal uh, Lake Worth Beach our neighbors mm -hmm. um, and they did pass a micro unit um, a met um, ordinance recently however they're full units meaning kitchenettes and bathrooms in each unit not shared down the hall and an SRO arrangement single room occupancy sorry um, with certain you know standards for common areas and it was not allowed outside of the mixed-use district so there's just things that you may want to contemplate as you consider creative ways to solve housing um, and where we should start um, our comp plan in terms of some of the efforts we're going to start this year with um, accessory dwelling units and some of these other things says to do it basically neighborhood by neighborhood studying. So I think just be really careful that maybe if you want to go in this direction with reintroducing, um, you know, something more akin to either a bed and breakfast rooming house, community residence type of living arrangement as an option for affordability, um, we should maybe start smaller than what is attached to your agenda item. May I ask Thank a question? You. you and I, I met with the gentleman, and it, as a concept, this sounds good, right? Because there, we do have a lot of people in the city living in these arrangements. There are. I mean, we just remove five people living in a house all unrelated, sharing a kitchen and a bathroom. It's not an appropriate arrangement for them. But done right, I feel like this is a way to provide people that don't have resources with housing. But one of the things that you and I discussed that I'm really concerned about is what can this become? Does it become a place where you have um, people in treatment or what have you? And I don't know if you had discussed this sure. previously we, when we met, but I think the there are, in order to embrace this, I think the concerns the potential downside to this have to be addressed well no because we, we can't be discriminatory right. in our housing mm -hmm. and so whoever wants to occupy these things we have to be fair and equal about it so no, but it, running it as a medical facility versus a sure a, an apartment is different and, right? I, and I just want to make the the discrepancy here the reason why we're calling these MCHUs and not SROs is because we are not SROs they're not sober homes they're not treatment facilities in order to legally and codify that discrepancy between what you're um, and I completely understand what you're saying and, and I hear that and we've heard that from the community as well um, in order to codify that discrepancy we're calling it something completely different because we don't want to be looped into that category of treatment facilities because it's this is a different service that we're providing and that we're seeking to provide um, and just to be also transparent we um, it was brought to us that we should apply this to more than one district and to apply it um, throughout the city and so that's what we submitted uh, we're happy to um, bring that down uh, you know find places where this may be more applicable maybe it's better in one district than not another district we're open to that um, we just want to have that discussion um, and so that's why we're here seeking at least the support of one commissioner so that we can begin to have that discussion we're happy to work with staff to alleviate their concerns and the concerns of uh, them and, and you as commissioners uh, because we don't want to do anything negative our intent here is is to provide a social service that's economically feasible that provides housing as you said there are currently uh, properties that are in this type of use right now um, that are 
in my opinion, substandard living legally, conditions. Not legally, I'll point out. Not legal, but they're substandard living conditions, and we're hoping to elevate the standard of living and the quality of life for these types of residents. Thank you. Anything else? Um, just, Anthea, could you speak to the potential downsides of if we were contemplating this on a very small scale, just say we said, okay, we, we, this potentially has a benefit to some of our residents. Well, what would, I mean, ultimately I think the, the question is, you know, whether or not what would for many of us be considered a substandard arrangement, right? Sharing a room and then sharing kitchens and, you know, youth hostel type of thing where it's fun to visit, but you don't necessarily always want to live there. But, you know, where you're sort of like, is that really the best way to solve our crisis? But then you think, oh gosh, we have a crisis. So I understand it's not that clear. Like we're, right. we're going back and forth. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do think that, I, I mean, right now we allow um, efficiency apartments that are 400 square feet. We limit CBD on what percentage of them those can be. You know, if you want to allow 250 square foot units, which is smaller, the smallest that's in this ordinance, um, that's something we can look at. I, I tend to cringe a little when I think that, you know, everybody should have it. Actually, like Worth's uh, draft requires a kitchenette and private bathroom in every room. And I think that goes a long way towards, you know, that. The other thing is that while we're worrying about, you know, potential impacts, you know, we are getting impacts from Airbnb. So how does this not turn into lodging? It's got a one month stay. There's supposed to be an income qualification. Um, you know, the way that we income qualify annual renters is through our neighborhood and community services group. You know, is that how we're going to make sure that's what's happening there? So, I, you know, there's a lot to unpack, and I, I you know, I think um, my 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 concern is is just if you're going to do it, that we stay out of the residential districts out of the gate. Um, but it's like, how does it, you know, there's hotel, youth hostel, dormitory, like what are we trying to do here? Right. And how much is too much in one place and all of those things. So it's a lot to consider. You could, um, you know, we are starting to look into the single family and the residential neighborhoods for some of the um, initiatives we talked about with increasing design standards, allowing accessory dwelling, mm -hmm. some of those. This is a little bit more intense and belongs in a different part. And so the question really is, do you want to start exploring that? And um, what are the standards you would expect someone to have? Like, is it okay to share a bathroom with people who are not related to you? 48 people who are not related to you. I don't know, 24 people who are not related well, to you. To be fair, the number of bathrooms in would be limited to the, would be a pro ratioed and scaled to the number of residents. So you wouldn't have one bathroom for 48, it would be per four people. Um, and uh, I totally under, understand those uh, those concerns. Uh, we're, we've heard it before, we've prepared for that. Um, we just want to have the, the discussion to say where can we put this, where could we not, what are the limits that you want to see, you know, what are we comfortable with. We're very flexible. Uh, we just want to have that discussion, um, quite frankly. Um, and so that's why we built in, for instance, the annual licensing and oversight. We understand that is a concern, and so we want to make sure that that's an option. So we try to build in as much of your questions right. and, and answer that but, as we could. Okay, so but if it's truly a place to live, why isn't it an annual lease like everybody else's apartment? Sure. Why um, is it month to month then? If it's so, truly a solution, so, okay, but we're not going to debate it right now. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to ask that um, right. only, only answer. No, no, no. Have, we have to sit down. So they're, they're discussing. Yeah, so if they have a question, what we're going to do is we're going to bring you up as we're discussing. If that's okay, just because what Me? we're doing is yes, oh, okay. both of you, both sure. of you. Sure. So in other words what we're trying to do up here is to just um, have the questions for anybody that has it and then have a discussion so it's not about a debate between the city and the applicant that sort of thing all right very good so did you get all your questions answered yeah I think so okay vice mayor sure thank you uh, thank you for the presentation and Thea thank you for your remarks um, I think it's a lovely uh, project in Lake Worth I, I wish you the best of luck I just am not in favor of it here thank you um, Commissioner Boylston and just for the record this isn't what no, no, they did something. They, something they, different. They oh, gotcha. They adjusted okay. it. Not us, but not them. Well, yeah, well the, the ordinance. Yeah, I think it's. Very, I honestly think it's very different. I think what they did in Lake Worth, I'd be more inclined to sponsor and to explore, um, because, like Andrea said, there are a lot of tools in the toolbox for affordable housing, and I feel like we're skipping over a lot of the tools that are right in front of us and right for our community um, to explore, and going to one that to use Anthea's word, is intense. Mm. Um, and like micro-housing, 
like the lowering the minimum square footage on a unit and the accessory dwelling units. All those are great tools that I would explore before um, exploring something like this. But I, but I will say that when we initially, when we initially met, um, it was in regards to this one unit. I think that was probably like a year ago. And I would have been supportive because this has been operating like that for years. Mm -hmm. And I've taken a tour of this building years ago. Um, and everyone seemed to be living just fine. It was a really nice, nice building. People were living fine. They were sharing you know, space together. It was fine. Um, I would have been supportive in something that had been happening for years to continue and to you guys to improve on that. Um, I don't know how that grew into it being city, you know, citywide and supporting something like that. So I wouldn't be supportive of that. I mean, they are stuck a little bit with the existing building on Fifth because mm -hmm. it was a non-conforming use that had a big enough gap that it ended. And so the right. only way to re-legitimize it is to amend the code somehow mm -hmm. or shift it to a residential type in or renovate the inside into full little units or, or conditional use, I think. Something mm -hmm. else. Uh, mm. I, I, we would have to look at the specific case. Yeah. Sorry. And the <laughs> feedback we got from, from the residents was they don't want something that's conditional use, which is why we didn't go that route. So we, we've done our homework within the neighborhood as well. On, then, on that particular property, which I didn't plan on referencing here today, but since it came up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then in, in, in addition, I'm concerned about the affordable aspect of it. We don't control the, the rate. And if they're being rented at one month at a time, you see a lot of people coming down here for, you know, looking for a place to see to stay at one. You see some of the rates in Europe and hostels going through the roof over the last few years. So um, yeah, I can't, I, I wouldn't be in, in support of moving forward with this. Commissioner B Johnson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I, um, when I read this, thank you for quoting me. I hope um, that wasn't what I was seeking, but uh, I do think that we don't necessarily always talk about the low income and the very, very low income. Um, however, I tried my level best to remember what this reminded me of. First of all, thank you for letting me know that that non-conforming building is what it is. I had no idea. Which there are many in the city operating. And that. I am finding that out. Yeah. And unfortunately, I am Please not very interrupt. happy with that uh, personally. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking not to interrupt. Yep, go ahead. No, that's all right. We're not back and forth, I'm sorry. Um, I'm looking at you, but I guess I should be looking at everybody. Um, but you told me what it was. I wanted to say it's like a tenement apartment back in the days when, if you look at the older movies, you have five or six, ten apartments on a floor and maybe a bathroom on each end and families living in it. And you said rooming house and boarding that house, yep. boarding house. Not. We're going backwards. We're going backwards in so many ways that I am so disappointed. I was happy to hear that Lake Worth maybe has broken the code. Today, if you do not have a mini kitchen, a bathroom, a private, we are opening ourselves. You said clean and safe. My number one thing would be clean and safe. In the middle of a pandemic that we are not out of yet, I would not be in favor of this type of a living arrangement. I don't know how many of these unacceptable housing arrangements have been a source of some of this COVID, but I would not want to support something that might be, because not just now, but in the future. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, COVID-19 might just be the beginning of many. So, sir, I'm sorry, I would not be in favor of anything that would have a communal bathroom or a communal kitchen. And um, as much as we don't afford housing for those who are in desperate need of it, this I don't believe is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was gonna suggest that we do have some very low, low um, residential units here in Delray Beach. We um, certainly um, have uh, made sure that our Seniors never lost that, uh, I think it's Section 8 housing over there behind the Target. Um, lakes, Lakes, Love Del Rey, I think it is. So um, there's like 400 units over there and we have um, smattering throughout the community and obviously we're always trying to find other opportunities to do the same, but this is not the answer. And I am with my colleagues, I think we are five, no, um, in non-support, so I'm sorry. 
All right, so that's that a no. Right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to workshop item number three, and this is um, Mr. Patrick Halliday. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hello, how are you? Um, I'm here today because let's talk a little bit about the history of what happened. Um, I'm the president of the Delray Beach Bike Club. And over the years, we've done a lot of things in the city to help the city raise money. Uh, the Witches event, which I'm part of the sponsor. Um, so many others, every event the city does that relates to bicycles. I always get a call because they call me the bicycle guy. Uh, so over 20 years now, I've dedicated uh, as much time and money as I can to the city for these activities. In 2018, there was a workshop much like this one today. Um, and this topic was up for decision. At the time, Commissioner Bathurst was away in Spain at a wedding, so he couldn't attend. Um, I think most of you were there. Um, and we had a city manager, uh, Mark Legier. And Mark uh, was at, within the meeting. When Bill got back, he said, I supported that, but I was away, so how come it wasn't a 3-2? It ended up being a 2-2 as a vote. And Mark told him, Bill, you had to be here. I mean, I know you left a letter, but you weren't f physically here. So Mark Legier told Bill, I don't have any problem with Patrick doing the pedicabs because there is no ordinance in the city against it, nor is there one for it. So from 2018, 19, 20, 21, for the last four years, the residents and merchants of downtown Delray have enjoy, enjoyed the pedicabs. Um, we're sponsored by the Opal, the, the new hotel, uh, Seagate Hotel, a Hyatt. Uh, have, for all the time up until March, we've had regular daily requests coming from these hotels because the people want it. The citizens want it, the community wants it, the residents want it. And when I asked some people, I said, you know, there was a time where we, the people were against it, and, he's, and people would say, why? We all want this. And one person said, the reason why I would be against it is that the only event, if anything, would happen to you. <laughs> I took that as saying, thank you for looking out for me, but I'm, I'm okay. So through uh, Mark and then Neil to Jesus, who was the interim city manager, and then through uh, Mr. Gratis, who was the city manager, I believe we went through four years. And for those years, uh, all the people that have events in the city, Daniel and the, the International Beatles Festival, and I can't name all the other events, uh, the tree lighting, uh, all the concerts at Old School Square, all these people have enjoyed the use of the pedicab because a lot of them don't want to ride in the golf cart. And I know that's um, hot, you know, popular, but there are a lot of people who just don't want to be in something with people they don't know. And the pedicab is usually a husband and wife or a boyfriend or girlfriend who are on a date night and they're just enjoying that kind of pleasant time out together, which I really think people need to spend more time doing. Um, so it's been very enjoyable, um, but I got a call out of the blue in March that said that uh, from the code that we were, you know, in violation. And that's why I started, you know, uh, moving forward to see, you know, what, what violation. Um, there wasn't any other in the, in the past three city managers. We set a... I guess you call it a president. The fact that, you know, operation was moving and being used and people loved it. There were no issues with the police or the fire department at all. Um, so I'm here today because they tell me that to have a business in, this, in the downtown district, you have to be approved by the city commission. And that means you have your list of approved businesses, doctor, lawyer, carpenter, retail shop, on this list. I'm not on that list. And for four, for 10 years, I've been trying to get on that list. And I've been told that the only way to get on the list is that the commission, you know, has to approve it. So we left in 2008 with a 2-2 vote to approve, only because Bill wasn't away and Bill would have been here with a 3-2. So here we are today because that happened. And uh, there are over 50 cities in, the, in Florida that have pedicabs. It's very common. Um, people enjoy it. Um, I, ha I went through the process of applying, got my certificate for zoning approved by the city. Um, so we're all ready to go. We just need to get back on track and 
you know, turn it around so people can enjoy what they've been enjoying for the last four years. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's accurate. Okay, I, I was going to ask you to, could you, zoning part. okay, could you um, just specify? To be, just to be clear, our code, if, if a use is not listed, it's not permitted. So that's why Mr. So how is Mr. Halliday's <laughs> business allowed to, um, you know, continue to operate between 2018 and 2021? My understanding was that that the code was involved, and Mr. Walther or his staff are here, that they were involved and they, they informed Mr. Holiday that he was not permitted to, to operate his business. All during that time? I believe when Mr. Lozier was here, there was a period of time where there was some type of an understanding. I think that's what my understanding was. When Mr. Jesus took over, he put a stop to it. Well, I was going to say, because I remember, if I'm not mistaken, that the reason that it was not permitted and this was something that the police and the fire were very much opposed to Correct. and um it was uh that that was one of the reasons why i think there might have been a two two i i don't know i remember that vote but it was brought before us that this was not something that they were willing to stand behind in favor okay yes. and just because i do remember because i remember my follow-up question to chief um Goldman at the time um, I said are you for more people on pedestrians and bikes and he said no <laughs> for more people in cars where they're sitting I said how about Ubers people getting in and out of cars he goes no and I'm like all right and I get your answer your answer has to be that right that you want everyone as safe as possible in cars but we can't think that way, and that's why I ended up voting for it. I was one of the two for it. So those were my follow-up questions to Chief Goldman, and he, honor he answered very honestly about that, and I wouldn't expect anything different. Um, and of course, if we ask our transportation or you know, our planner, they'll say, I want everybody on bikes and, you know, and, and walking. So I don't know what your feeling is. I would love to sponsor this one, but again, I wanna make sure that we're not gonna be you know, wasting any, any time to move this forward. We did have it for a few years, I, I don't think there was any issues. I always saw people on them. They're uh, well lit. Um, I think they're very much something that fits in the village by the sea. Uh, I don't know if there's a way to do like uh, you know a revisit every every year um, to see how that program is you know is going. Um, put something like that on it, but that would be figured out in the next step from here. Um, so I would love to hear any of the you know concerns on moving this forward. Okay. Um, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you very much. I believe Mr. Halliday has, I want to say it's, it's Halliday, has been before this commission ever since I've been sitting up here, and the answer has been a consistent no. I did not realize he had operated for a period of time. There was a lot of things that were happening in the city that, of course, maybe I, of course, was not um, aware of. Um, I think the issue has always been safety. We have so many different modes of transportation trying to occupy a very small space. And when we talk about safety, this will just be adding one more item to that. We have had so many bicycle, and I'm not saying this type of pedicab, but so many bicycle um, incidences wherein the bicyclists don't observe the stop and go traffic um, signals. They will go around and round and round. Not that Mr. Halliday is going to do this. I don't know of any incidences, but I did not again know that he was operating. So I have not changed. I believe I was one of the no votes because I listen or try to listen to our safety um, units in our city, and they were adamantly against it. They're the ones who are going to have to. Um, encounter the situations, the problems, the um, accidents. So if they're still against it and I don't, didn't reach out, no one reached out to me to say, please don't do this to us. So I'm going to go back on what I did 2018 or whenever I voted and my answer is going to be no. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. You know, I feel like I'm watching that movie Groundhog Day. <laughs> because every couple of years I have this presentation. It's true. <laughs> and I hear the same things that everyone wants. And I've been here as long time. as you have, Absolutely. and it's the same thing right, for me. Right. Well, I, I got it by a couple. Yeah, you or know, one. One, 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 one. one. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't have any, I've never had a call. I've never had an email. I've never had someone on Atlantic Avenue say, God, we come to Delray because of those pedicabs. Now, you know, I hear about bike guy. I, I, 
I, I hope Alper Witchwagon isn't watching this <laughs> because they've been selling bikes in the city a long time. And I would consider his family the, the bike people. But uh, the comments that were made by my colleagues about uh, police and fire against it, they're still against it. Uh, if we were talking about other modes of transportation, if you recall, many, many years ago, we used to have the horse and buggy going oh, up yeah. and down Atlantic oh, yeah. Avenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, remember that? All it does is back up traffic. And I, I just, I continue in, in respect. I just can't go forward and, and support this. Sorry. Mr. I mean, uh, Deputy Vice Mayor Cassell. I don't, I'm not certain that I would support this either, but has it actually been operating of late? I mean, has, it's not been, so it was operating Since and now March. it's not operating? Yeah, let me Until clarify March. something. Um, Neil DeJesus was not against this, nor even approached me negatively about it at all. But are you neither, operating neither, currently, though? That's yeah, no. Okay. Well, there are, you haven't there are individuals, so there's a difference here. We're here today f because it, of it being a business. The bicycle itself, the sto Florida has a statute. It's called the Uniform Traffic Code. The police know about it. And in this traffic code, status 316-003 clearly identifies bicycles as two wheels or two front wheels or any combination of such. Our vehicles are allowed to be ridden in, the, in, sto in Florida on the streets because of their classification as a bicycle and the law enforcement cannot disallow the use. So it's just like having a two-wheel bicycle, only it has three. So there are people who you will see out now with the bikes, mm -hmm. as, as the last mm -hmm. person was out Saturday night. They're not part of me, they're individuals who own bicycles. And according to the statute, they're allowed to ride regardless. It's when you make it a business. Charge people for the transportation. Well, there's even not even that, there's no fee. So it's free if you, unless you want to tip. So because there's no fee, there's no vehicle for hire. So that's why you have the issue here in front of us today is, is allowing it to be a business to operate in the CBD. Take the bicycle operation out of the picture because even if it doesn't become a business, they'll still operate their bicycles. Okay. They, have the, they have the right to operate their bicycles. You can't take that away. If you wanted to, you'd have to go to Tallahassee. You'd have to get a judge. We understand. Yeah, okay. So I just wanted to clarify the fact that Neil Jesus did not um, say anything to me or anybody, and neither did um, Mr. Gratis. Okay. Thank um, you. So let's go back to, I think it was Commissioner Casal. Sure. No, I'm good. I mean, I would, I, listen, I think they're lovely, but I have to agree. I don't know if they're good for our streets, the congestion, the traffic all the other issues, but I thank you for coming and presenting. Vice Mayor. Sure, just for the record, Neil DeJesus and Chief Goldman recommended against them because thank of the you. width and not enough space. I have to tell you, I was gonna say the same thing. I have a recollection that's very different where it was Neil DeJesus and it was, um, it was Chief Goldman that basically said no to this and they were very adamant about it. In addition to that, if we just take it as a business, if it's just the business, we can't give it to Patrick Halliday's business. We have to then go out, if we're going to do this, and open it up to others, um, I, I believe, yes, and because why would we be just able to select? No, you, no. so he would have to do a text amendment to basically, uh, it's, I, we would put it under the segues portion of the LDRs that's already there, it's mm -hmm. something, a similar type of business. It would be regulated, the city has every right to regulate it, and then at that point, if the ordinance is adopted, then he would have to, you know, if you made it like a conditional use, or I, I don't really know, because we haven't really looked into it, and the, the request was kind of vague. So, you know, you, he would have to come back, and he's not running a city business, so it's not some, I mean, I guess you could do an RFP, almost like freebie or something like that, but the first step is allowing the business in the city. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And if we're going to... Well, if we're going to find a solution for all this congestion, the solution is to keep people out of cars. That may be so, that may be so Commissioner Bolson. However, adding, we, we did not vote for Razor scooters. Um, I can see opening this Pandora's box, wherein someone who thinks it's exotic to do a rickshaw, um, I can open the city up to um, do horse and carriage or donkeys and wagons. So I, I think that we, we like it the way it is. We don't like the congestion. And adding one more 
vehicle, free, not free, paid, block by block, it is just not something that we want to introduce to the CBD. Did I say it right? You did. Thank you. All right. I don't think you have support um, if you're trying to get. Uh, I'm not going to sponsor it. Okay. All right. So I think that if that's all that we have Thank to say. Thank you for then your that presentation. That um, portion, and we're moving on to workshop um, item number four, which is noise ordinance. Much awaited noise ordinance. So good afternoon, Lynn Jellen is uh, from the City Attorney's Office. I'm here with Bennett uh, Brooks, who is from Brooks Acoustics. He is our consultant that's facilitating on the city with uh, drafting this noise ordinance. Basically today, we're going to go over the data that he's collected and analyzed. Um, I would like to get some direction from the commission on, on how we're gonna move forward with this ordinance, and then I'll let you know what the next steps are gonna be. So obviously the goal of any ordinance is, um, and we talk about this all the time, to create certainty, uh, manage expectations. When a resident you know, pulls up our code of ordinances online, they should trust that what's in there is what's being enforced and what's being applied throughout the city or whatever, whatever zoning district. Um, and we wanna be fair and consistent. And especially in, in this case with the noise ordinance, we wanna find a, a balance. We need to strike that balance between the entertainment district and the residents that live there and the other businesses as well. So hopefully um, at the end of our ordinance process, we'll, we'll have that. So just to give you a brief um, timeline of where, what we did this, wow, it's almost, it's over a year ago. Mm -hmm. You gave me direction to review the current noise ordinance. I, uh, thereafter, I uh, retained um, Bennett to assist uh, the city in this process. Uh, we did hold a public workshop with the stakeholders. Um, that was on April 21st of this year to get some, um, you know, give a little bit of education as well as um, c consider the concerns and, and the needs of the residents and businesses. Um, thereafter, we started doing our sound tests. So we put up those really um, interesting uh, sound meters throughout the city. We did short-term and long-term um, meters. We, uh, we also uh, held two sound walks uh, where some residents and business owners participated and, and gave us their own thoughts and perceptions on the level of noise and how it made them feel essentially. And we've had various meetings with staff, police, um, code, planning, because it really is a group effort and it's a collective process. Um, so I just talked about the data collection. We did do a lot of short-term and long-term tests. You're gonna see some of those results. Um, Bennett is here because he's, he's gonna explain it to you. It's very high level. Um, but we put them in the locations where the sound is emanating from, the hot spots of the city, Johnny Brown's, Tin Roof. Um, we went down to OG, but at the time they were closed. We went to Honey, we went to 3rd and 3rd. So we really got a good broad spectrum of the areas of the city where we typically receive the most complaints about the high levels of noise. And um, we also, part, the sound walk also included those areas in order to be able to you know, get some one-on-one -on -one perspective from people, you know, what their perception of the sound is. So I just talked about the sound meters. I think I had sent you these pictures. You know, the nerds and all of us love these things, and, uh, you know, we're, we're very, uh, you know, um, intrigued by them. Some of the residents were, too. So this is where I'm going to call Bennett up to start explaining some of this. So it is, it doesn't look so uh, easy to see up there, but I think if you look at it on your, on your iPad, you'll be able to see it better. So these are the decibels. So if you recall, currently our noise ordinance is subjective. And subjective means the individual person who's perceiving the noise, they're gonna decide if it's unreasonable or not. If it's you know, subject to some standards, but really it's gonna be up to that individual person. What we're trying to move forward to and what I need direction on today is whether we should move to the objective standard. I will say in our discussions internally, Back in 2012, that was the last time the noise ordinance was changed. That's where we went to this subjective standard. So before that, we had decibels. And I think there was a concern that um, there was a constitutional issue because, you know, think about it, over 10 years ago, the technology isn't what it was. And, you know, the readings weren't fair. And there was, you know, an applicability issue as to whether or not the ordinance was constitutional. So we went to this subjective standard. And we've, we've had that for nine years now. And I think from everything you can tell, from the complaints you get from residents, from the complaints you get from staff, and everything that you hear, it's not working. So we need to do something else. 
And I do feel that with the technology that we have now, we have an expert who's going to be training our staff on how to use the technology. Those things coupled together with this data, I think it's going to give us an ordinance that we can enforce. And so, Bennett, do you want to explain some of these numbers that we see up here? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. And uh, uh, Madam Mayor, Commissioners, uh, thanks for taking the time today and for the opportunity to present this information. Appreciate it. She violated the I'm noise. So uh oh. There you go. That's <laughs> noise right there. How many decibels? Uh -oh. That was unintentional. Was... So, <laughs> my apologies. That's, that's I thought fine. I had that on silence. Well, thank you. Thank you again. And uh, thanks, Lynn, for uh, helping me put this together. She really tightened this up for us. So, we can uh, be respectful of your time. But uh, uh, we did do a lot of testing. Uh, just to, a little background it was. Uh, kind of focused on what we call the entertainment district, which is between Swinton and uh, Federal uh, Highway northbound, and then 2nd North, and then 2nd uh, South uh, Street. So most of it was inside there. There were a couple of locations that were outside of that district. Uh, but just to review here, uh, these were eight where we did uh, a lot of the short-term measurements and the long-term measurements. These were, this is a summary of the short term. So you can see the numbers that we put up there. These are averages of um, 15 minute records that we took. And I'll show you actually a detail of one of these. But uh, so it's the average over the 15 minutes. It could be music, it could be voices, it could be cars going by, all these different sources. The highest level. Uh, you know, just to go through them, alley south of it, uh, Atlantic, which was behind Tin Roof and Honey, uh, East Atlantic and Old School Square Park, uh, Northeast uh, Second and Second, which is Lulu's and O'Connor's and the Ray, uh, new, newly built over there, East Atlantic, Johnny Brown's, uh, Southeast Second, which was Throw Social primarily, although you have Salt and the Office over in that area as far as entertainment, entertainment venues and the alley uh, behind the OG, which uh, was we tested for sound and then we did our sound walks and we turn, it turned out that he had closed that day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we didn't get a, a good sound walk uh, mm -hmm. data over there, but uh, we went one time anyway. And then uh, over on West Atlantic, Breathe and Ultra, which at one time there was 404 over there. They're not there anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then third and third, which is uh, those last two were outside the entertainment district. And let's see if I can advance. Uh, well, I can before I go, before I actually, before I go, I just wanted to mention, I'll go back one. Uh, thank you. Um, so the quietest one overall was third and third, which you would expect is kind of residential over there. And then uh, the uh, highest level was Johnny Brown's. Mm -hmm. So that was and that's open air. So you yeah, sure. open air. So that's kind of to be expected. So let's see if I hit. I the got it. No, I got big, it. The, okay, there we go. So there's one of these uh, 15 minute records, and uh, the red line that you see is the max. Uh, these are one second samples. So every one second, the computer uh, takes a sample and uh, it gives you that number. And uh, the max would be, you know, due to things like, uh, you know. This is behind. This is in the alley behind uh, uh, Honey at a place called Royal Atlantic Condos on the corner of their property line, and so either dumping bottles or a loud vehicle and so forth. And then the blue is kind of the average over that. It's just one second. So you know, it's a. But you can see it's pretty consistent. You know, the level kind of bounces around around 65 there, which is you know conversational type of level, just to give you a. Uh, uh, a scale on it. Uh, so, you know, we have about 60 of these that we did all around the city. And then we also have the uh, 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 other measurements. Let me, let me uh, anybody have a question on this? We'll we keep did the, going. We'll do the, we did the long term. Uh, so, what we did was these were the interesting meters. Uh, we had the one on the tripod, which att attracted attention while I was out there. Uh, but also, uh, I think people were looking at these, and they could see, you know, if it was up there or not, obviously, because uh, it was there for, you know, up to a week. Uh, and, um, you know, obviously, uh, you can see the microphone sticking out. It's away from the pole. It's, it's gathering data. And these were also like one-second type of samples, but they were analyzed on a one-hour 
basis. So you wouldn't have too many squiggly lines in there. And uh, this is, you know, we have uh, eight of these as well going over the periods of time. But this one here, just to kind of give you a, a taste of it, the alley behind tin roof and honey. Uh, and you can see, if I can figure out this pointer here, uh, maybe this There's is a it. mouse. There's a Get mouse. Use the mouse. Okay. Yep. Use the mouse. Roll it around oh. until you get there the. You uh, I see there. it. It's kind of. Where is it? There it is in the middle. Hey. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, so this, uh, these different lines are different kinds of ways of analyzing the data. It's all in the computer. Uh, the red again is the max over that one hour period. The L1 is one percent of the time. So if there, an hour has 60 times 6, 60 seconds times 60 minutes, 3,600 seconds. That would be 36 seconds per hour, okay, and so forth. Like uh, L10 is 10% of the time, then the, uh, the uh, blue is the average, and um, then the green is 90% of the time. So that's sort of like your baseline. So you can see as a baseline on, uh, uh, you know, the weekend nights, yeah, it kind of goes up higher there. The green line goes up higher and, and commensurately with all the other ones. And then during the week, not as much. Um, at the next, at another location, the next one, we've got, okay, so this is uh, Second Avenue across from Throw, where you saw the, uh, I just showed you the pictures. And you can see, yes, uh, Friday, Saturday night, uh, we're averaging a background of about 70 or so. That's what's basically happening continuously. And then the other nights, not as much. And then, you know, in the uh, wee hours, it, it drops down. And uh, on the next one, you can see on West Atlantic, uh, that's basically traffic. There was very little music coming out of the nightclub there. Uh, at all and uh, this is all this is basically showing you what the traffic looks like on Atlantic West Atlantic where there's a little bit more uh, speed involved obviously people are, you know there's a there's a traffic light uh, a half a block from there and you can see yeah that's basically what's happening traffic wise so you can almost get traffic counts out of this uh, out of this data but okay so what do we do with all this we we summarized it by saying okay the patterns uh, bless you are typical for the time of day and the day of the week that's that was good to know it made sense uh, and they varied by location which you would expect um, you know what's the activity is it traffic is it entertainment is it people uh, so um, you know it was could be pretty high due to a loud vehicle uh, and then, you know, based on your percentage of time that you're looking at, um, you know, it, it'll drop down. But your, your say, average over the hour, uh, you know, was probably in the, uh, you know, 60 to, to 70. So that's conversational levels <clears throat> again. But uh, that's what we measured. And, you know, that's what would be expected in a, a typical urban entertainment district such as we have. So um, those are the uh, results of the long-term study. Now let's see what we've got coming up next. So, okay, so let's get to the sound walks. We measured the physical sound levels, and that's one thing. And then the other part of the equation is uh, what are people hearing? What, and what are they thinking? How are they perceiving this information? And this is kind of a new way of looking at it. Um, there's a, a new science that's been developed over the last decade or so called soundscape uh, analysis, and that, that's based on people's perceptions. It's, uh, it's scientific, it, you can measure it, it has numbers, but it's, and it's not just opinions, it's a measured perception. So why are we doing this? Well, uh, because we want to give uh, people the uh, power to uh, have that data and have that information when they're looking to do uh, management. This is really taking sound and thinking of it as a resource. Uh, it's uh, not just a waste. So noise would be, you know, legal definition of noise is unwanted sound, but we have sound. So it's a, so it's a, it's a resource to manage, not just a waste. So a, a good example would be, okay, people don't like honking horns, but 
If it's you and you happen to be crossing the street looking the other way and a horn honks, that could save your life. So then that would be a resource. That's a good thing, you know. Uh, so we're trying to take, this is just a physical phenomenon. It's, you know, people are doing this. It's a resource to manage, just like, you know, our wonderful sea air, water, uh, you know, traffic. It, it, you know, how do we manage this? So we want to manage the resource and the, the objective is quality of life right. for uh, residents, successful businesses, making Delray better. So, so that's the, uh, so that's the idea. So if I can just interrupt. So the second portion of the study is um, we asked volunteers to follow uh, Bennett around the city. And what you see on the right there, that paper, each, each volunteer completed um, a section of that form for each location that they right. attended so that we could capture their perceptions. Correct. And so, so we this got is a the lot data. Of, we got a lot of, uh, we got a lot of, uh, let me just go, go back one, one. There we go. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, we got a lot of information here. So this was all put in spreadsheets, all analyzed uh, for all the people who filled out uh, the questionnaire on each spot. And just to tell you where they were, we started right here at City Hall to give you kind of a, like a baseline, quiet uh, residential area. And then we walked up, it was a lot of walking. We walk, walked up to second and second. Then we had this whole group. We walked up to third and third, down to uh, uh, Johnny Brown's, uh, then over and across to um, Worthing Park which is salt in the office and then down to throw social a little bit uh, over to behind the OG back up to the alley behind throw uh, excuse me tin roof and honey and then uh, and old uh, school square park and then all the way out to uh, uh, West Atlantic breathe and then back to City Hall and people People enjoyed the walk. It was great. Uh, I think we got a lot of great information uh, from our participants. And so, yes, as Lynn was explaining, they filled out this questionnaire, a lot of detail. Here's some of the summaries. Uh, we have four questions, which were actually codified in an international standards uh, standard for Soundscape Soundwalk. So uh, one of the questions is, how loud is it here? And you can see on a scale of one to five, we really made it zero to four because the first answer is not at all. So that's a zero. So the loudest uh, thing here, and you know, the left was on a Wednesday, the right was on a Saturday. So you can see the difference in the day of the week. Uh, on a Saturday, uh, Throw got the highest, uh, uh, Second Avenue got the second, you know, highest, uh, uh, mark and then there were a couple of others sprinkled in there usually throw and Johnny Brown's and surprisingly the alley behind uh, tin roof and honey did not get very high marks on loudness uh, the next question was how pleasant is it here so you can see on the left is City Hall everybody loves City Hall so <laughs> that's uh, that was a you know there's the data right there um, but you know it depends on how you know not just the sound level but you know, your environment. Um, you know, an alley isn't considered, you know, as pleasant as walking around on, on uh, Atlantic Avenue. So that's, uh, that's um, you know, an answer that was a good answer. Uh, uh, whoops, skip one. Um, how pleasant is it here? Uh, how, the next question, how appropriate would the sound that you're hearing be to the surrounding? So that gives it context. That says, yes, in this place, is it right or is it not right? And we have all that data there, and you can see there's differences uh, between a Wednesday and a Saturday night. Um, the green is throw. Uh, uh, I look trying to read it small letters, but you can see we have all that data. Uh, and then just quickly, the next one is uh, did we go? How pleasant is it here? Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm doing the wrong wrong yeah. direction. Okay, and then would you like to come back to this place again? That's sort of like the money question, right? So, uh, you know, and we have various uh, levels. And again, you know, the City Hall scored high marks, so we were happy with that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, these, this, all this data now, we, and just, you know, the people did have an opportunity to write their comments. One of the things was, you know, in, instead of, you know, they all wrote personal comments, but 
uh, we ask them, what do you hear? Mm -hmm. And these are some of the things, music, uh, traffic, people, and, and other things. And you can see for each location, it was a little bit different. Some places, you know, they heard the music more. Uh, other places, they heard the traffic more or people uh, having conversations. So, you know, this is all important to understand what the context of the locality is. And so now we have this, and this is data. So uh, being data-based uh, in this effort, we, you know, this gives us all that information. Um, and uh, so uh, you can see the differences there. Old school square park music and traffic, for example. In Breathe, it was, or West Atlantic, it was just traffic. So uh, this is all very good information. And, you know, to summarize it for you, uh, it was pleasant here in Delray Beach in the entertainment district. I mean, that was the bottom line that we got. Uh, you know, there were some differences in different places. Um, and uh, people did not think the area was exceptionally loud, except for, you know, the exception of uh, uh, Johnny Brown's and Throw, and that the sound was appropriate. So that's good information. Can I ask a question? Sure. With, because I, I agree with you, it's very pleasant. And I think in the entertainment district, Johnny Brown's, if there weren't music, we would all be upset. You know, we love right. it. What you, the music that you hear, it's perfectly appropriate. But from my perspective, I think one of the bigger concerns we have is the noise from motorcycles or cars. And sometimes it's, it's purposeful noise, right? down on Atlantic, how do we control it when we think it's not good? That was the purpose of and And, we're you know, we've, we've gone through this, and I, I get it, but my question also is I don't think anybody wanted to know if we were pleasant or not. I think we were actually thinking about trying to figure out how do we control it go to court over something like, uh, you know, over loud noise and win in court. I thought that's where we were going, so I'm not sure. Have we just not got there? Or? No, we're getting there. Okay. So... Yeah. So what we're bringing before you today is is the data. And so at some point, we're going to have to determine what those decibels are going to be. So what the ordinance is going to do is it's going to set the decibel. Mm -hmm. So if the decibels are 60, that's what it'll be for the entertainment district, for example. Mm -hmm. Anything over that, it's like speeding. That's going to be a violation of the ordinance. So it's clear, it's concise, and it's enforceable because at the end of the day, it's just a number. You're not relying, you know, your perception of what's loud and mine might be very different. And so that's why it's, in my opinion, it's best to go to that objective standard so that we don't have to worry about people exercising their discretion, essentially. Right. And so, yes, we are going to address the vehicles. Vehicles are actually addressed by Florida statute at this point. Right. We don't have the decibel readers, so it's a process, right? So we need to get the decibel readers. We need to have somebody that teaches us how to use the decibel readers, but more importantly, you need to have somebody standing there when it happens. Because if somebody's not there when it happens, it's like it didn't happen. And so it's not, it's gonna be meaningless, right? So there, there's also that issue too. Um, there's, so first we're gonna decide if, if everybody is comfortable moving forward with this objective standard. We're gonna look at the sound sources. So there's different sources of sound. Obviously the entertainment district is, has to be addressed. Then we're gonna address the residential districts because obviously the decibel reading in a residential district is gonna be markedly different than what's in the entertainment Absolutely. district. Because when you buy a house in the entertainment district, you have an understanding that it's gonna be loud there and you're buying into that atmosphere, that, that type of neighborhood. So those are gonna be different and that's why that neighborhood is essentially carved out in our code, right? So we're gonna address lawn equipment, I, but again, you know, we're not gonna have a police officer stationed at everyone's house, you know, looking Understood. for this. So a lot of these things, you know, it's it's tough on the city because we're not there. And if nobody's there, it you know, it basically didn't happen. Right. But, you know, again, it lets people know what what the expectations are. Trash dumping and pickup, that's actually address we'll address it in the code, but that's also addressed in contractual arrangements that we have with providers. What we thought, um, as staff in discussing this with uh, Mr. Brooks is that we do need to have a tiered level mm -hmm. of decibels, right? So I think a Johnny Browns that's already essentially grandfathered in, mm -hmm. um, they're open air. So to set a 70, and I'm making up these numbers, I don't know what they mean, but to say that's gonna be 70 and that's gonna be the same as 
a hotel, right. that's unfair, right? right? And that's setting them up for failure. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand that it's open air, that noise travels, and so that would be one level, which would be the open air. The second would be the inside venues, where the music is, is inside, doors closed, they would have a certain reading. And then the last would be the residential. So, you know, our position is working with Bennett, you know, we'll come up with those, those numbers for you in order for you to be able to make an educated decision. The more important thing that I think um, that's gonna come out of this is that um, my, I, I'm gonna recommend that we have a conditional use process so that, you know, we're not, we're being proactive instead of reactive. This ordinance is reactive. Mm -hmm. We're trying to manage what we got and trying to make sure that everyone can potentially live, you know, symbiotically. But if we are able to have a conditional use process, anybody that comes in going forward would come before the commission. And at that point, you have the ability to mitigate the impacts of whatever that establishment's gonna do. Right. So for example, when Tin Roof came in, you know, had they had on their site plan that they're gonna have an open air venue, they would come before you and you would work with staff in order to come up with conditions that you felt would mitigate those impacts. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't feel that there was anything that could mitigate the impacts, you have the ability to say no. Mm -hmm. And so that's being proactive. That's, you know, handling the problem before it becomes one. The other thing that we, we are gonna promote if the commission um, gives us direction is having limiters. And what a limiter is, it's almost like a lockbox. And it, and it holds you know, the level of the noise. And so you know, new development would be, be, be required to have this box there, and the noise is set at whatever the city says the level is, and it doesn't get changed. And because it's a lockbox situation, the, the inability of management to turn up the music at one o'clock in the morning, it's not gonna be there because of this function. Mm -hmm. So again, these are things that we can do going forward so that you know the neighbors and, and the public have assurances, but also the businesses are also set up that they can succeed as well because it's, we have to strike that balance. The entertainment district isn't going anywhere. It's, it's a very lively area for the city, so we need to find that, that sweet spot where you know everybody can, can deal with it. So those are some of the things that um, we're recommending. It, the, what you're gonna see when we bring it back before you is it's just a complete rewrite. So we're gonna deal with all the different sources of the noise, but I did want to make sure that, at a minimum, you gave me some direction as to, number one, if we wanna do subjective or objective, and number two, what your thoughts would be on the tiered levels as well as um, a conditional use um, category for and, and uh, just to be clear, this is for new development. Right, so absolutely. people are there now. If uh, you know, if a uh, you know a business is faced with a code violation and they're starting to get repeated code violations, they may want to do this, you know, to save themselves the aggravation and the complaints. You know, people say, "Oh, the noise is too loud." If you have that limiter, well, the limiter says it's this, you know. So no, they're not too loud. They're actually within the code. So it, you know, it helps the business as well in order to stave off you know, the complaints and the code issues potentially from the city. So um, just to wrap it up, the next steps are we're gonna prepare a draft ordinance based on today's direction. We're gonna hold a second public workshop with all the stakeholders to invite them to review the ordinance and, you know, answer any questions. Sometimes, you know, we get really great feedback from the public and, you know, we may be able to incorporate that in. And then it's gonna come before you for first and second reading. Um, and at that point, if it is adopted, then we'll go back and start with the training of personnel in order to be able to properly enforce the ordinance. Okay. Good. Yes, wow. She yes. does a great job, she doesn't she? She summed it up, <laughs> didn't she? She took yes. it all the way to home. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, Mr. Bennett? Uh, well, we appreciate, it. again, the opportunity to present this to you. If you ever have questions, I'd be happy to answer them, uh, you know, uh, uh, offline. And, uh, you know, but uh, again, it's uh, defined as, as uh, as Lynn mentioned, it's, we're finding the sweet spot based on the data, and we want to make this, uh, you know, give you the ability to manage this resource. So, because it provides revenue, it helps uh, uh, fund the city, uh, and it's, uh, you know, quality of life for the people who uh, live in Delray. So, thank well, you. Stay right there because we're going to probably discuss and have questions. So, if you okay. don't mind. Um, okay. All right. So, we'll start with uh, Commissioner Johnson, if you'd like. Oh, yes. Thank sure. you. I'll go first. Uh, thank you very much for the hard work that this must have been. Thank I have you. a concern. You only did the alley behind Tin Roof and Honey. Why the alley? Well, there were there are residents back there, but uh, we were actually on the other side, right across Honey and Tin Roof in Old School Square Park. So, you know, we did both sides. Okay, very good. Because 
I experienced, uh, there was a rally at Old School Square, a rather quiet rally, <laughs> and um, immediately at 2.30, I just had to leave because the sound coming from the business, whose name I won't say. We already know. Yeah, okay, very good. I understand. Very good. <laughs> it was overpowering. Yes. No, if I may, Ms. no, Miss Johnson. It was, it was the <laughs> old question. It was the people um, practicing getting ready, t testing their sound equipment for the evening's concert at all? I have no idea, but it was overpowering. Was oh. and it was. It was a sound check. Correct. That's correct. At old school square. Correct. correct. On the stage. No, 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 no. This came from across the street. There was nothing over at the pavilion. This wasn't that rally. This the other was day? a. This was a few. Oh, this was another round. Yes, not the one we were attending to. No, I think okay. it was maybe a year or two ago. Oh. And so I said, if this is what, let me go, let me go back mm -hmm. a little. I don't live around there. I don't know what the residents behind it, in the alley across the alley, but being at Old School Square, without competing with a, a concert at the Pavilion, and this sound coming, and I don't know if they were practicing or warming up or whatever, but it was overpowering. And I would imagine someone in the northeast uh, palm, palm mm -hmm. trail mm -hmm. would probably hear it. And I don't know Johnny Browns. I've not been around to hear. But I appreciate the effort. I remember and will always remember how a resident came to us about a business that is no longer in operation, West Atlantic Avenue. Mm -hmm. and unbelievable the gentleman was close to tears and I said how can we do this to our residents now they were there before the restaurant or yeah. the whatever mm -hmm. the, or the the business and had we had that at that particular time we would have had something but I understand later that it was not just the business it was after the business closed the party moved to the uh, northern part in the alley of this residence and so that's police to me. That's code. I don't know if we have code enforcement out at that time. It's going to be not just our decibels. It's going to be an active code enforcement activity, and just It'll be regular code residents. And police. It'll be joint. Joint. Yes. And the one thing I am concerned about, of course, everybody knows you cannot live in the city Fourth of July. You just cannot. It's not just the fireworks over on the beach. It's your neighbor behind you throwing firecrackers into your yard. And it's others who just think it's such a good thing to do two and three o'clock in the morning to set off. And that starts a week before mm -hmm. and often goes past it. And then you add the occasional party on a Friday or Saturday night wherein they think I want to hear what their theme music is, and I do not. Um, and sometimes it goes past midnight, and I thought we had a noise ordinance that we said do. you should shut it down mm -hmm. 10 o'clock. I don't know. No, no, no. 11? No. It depends on the day, isn't it? There's it's a, a Saturday. Yeah. I don't know what it is. But sometimes I can force myself to go to sleep so I don't hear it. Well, you, we you, you brought up a very good point because uh, there's really two pieces to this when you're thinking about it in terms of the behavior. Uh, one is, you know, a business operation that's a fairly continuous, and then you have the, you know, uh, sporadic things that happen that as are uh, private, as you know, in a nuisance like a, you know, a, a house party or something mm -hmm. like that. So, so there's, we're, we're, our goal here is to try to give you the comprehensive tool that comes at it from an ordinance point of view and a zoning point of view so that you have all the tools at your disposal. And unfortunately, now that uh, any calls made, you must identify yourself. I'm gonna, probably going to be a target, so I may not call. And if the code enforcement officer doesn't happen to be driving down my street or that street, uh, it won't be recognized. But that's as it goes. That's what you have when you live in an urban environment. Well, and true. I thank you for your efforts. Well, well, thank you. But you you brought up some excellent points. So you know that's and and just to show you, I think. You were looking at the it, where you were was on the second, uh, the left side there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's old school Square Park there. So that's looking at uh, Johnny Browns and Honey from oh, from there. Tin roof, you mean? Tin roof, excuse me. 
uh, tin and roof and, uh, and honey, and there's a long-term monitor up on the pole or on the tree, and then there is a, uh, a short-term monitor there. So we did both sides, mm -hmm. and uh, we're very cognizant of that. So that's why we may have to use the tiered approach for open air, uh, inside venues, and then residential. I thank you. It's a great effort. I, we love our entertainment district, and we all know that the louder the music, the more people are going to contribute to this because now I want Lynn it. to hear everything I'm saying mm -hmm. because it's over so it. mm -hmm. over and over and yeah. five or six, ten, Usually twenty go people. Home with no voice. Yeah. Well, well it's, it's interesting because uh, more cities are coming to this and that's why we, we take a look at, at the uh, examples for from our you know sister cities around the state and uh, for example I believe it was in July Miami Beach just adopted the limiter concept they had had it in you know different applications before but basically they sound person sets that up uh, with all the dials and numbers so that when you go across the street or in, you know it's it doesn't exceed that level and then they lock it up and that's it. So that's now a requirement. So there, there are certain tools that you can have that will work and make it a kind of a level playing field fair for everybody. Very good, good. thank you so much. Okay. Commissioner Boylston, anything? Yeah, you, you uh, mentioned in regards to different days, right, and mm -hmm. tiering it and all of that. What about different times of the day? Because mm -hmm. I would piggyback on uh, Commissioner Johnson's comment if I'm walking by there at you know Friday at 11 o'clock that sounds about right but that same volume Sunday be 2 p.m. Right. which I've been in that situation as well that doesn't feel right mm -hmm. um, so can you speak to that a little bit yeah absolutely that was one of the things that we uh, we looked at in the uh, let me get back to that summary slide that uh, there, I think what you're talking about is uh, the lights out, noise out, or 1 or 2 p.m., a decision can be made on a time of day. Mm -hmm. And the time of day is something we, you know, it's not a decibel. It's what we call administrative control. It's, you know, place, time. You can, it's, it's obvious whether it's happening or not. And you can set that for entertainment. You can set that for trash pickup. You can set that for, you know, lawn equipment, mm -hmm. times of day that are acceptable and times of day that are not acceptable. So those are all under consideration. And day of the week, too. And day of the week, like yes. A Sunday Holidays is not and so forth. necessarily a day that everybody wants to hear just smashing music in the middle of the day. That's right. And, and, and Palm Beach County actually has some times of day that are you know acceptable and not acceptable for you know for construction and sure. things like that that's okay. another may i just add one more thing sure. um, mayor i don't quite understand how we're going to stop the dumpsters because they lure them and that noise you're not going to ever stop not going to be able you to. can you can restrict the times of day that the trash can be collected so it can't be collected before 8 a.m but again that i think is more contractual um, because there you have a franchise within the city right. and so that will deal with the contract but again as much as we can address in the code we will yes and the other thing that I don't think and I'm very pessimistic we don't have the personnel to monitor those who have a beautiful Harley and can't ex restrain themselves from revving it up I know they do and uh, these little cars that have the I don't know mufflers. what they're called. Mufflers. No, mufflers, mufflers is it? Yeah. Mufflers that, you know, you you just got to go through between uh, Swinton and Federal and just rev it up. So, mm -hmm. I, I, that's a good one. I, good luck with that one. There, there might be an uh, there might be a solution to that. I'm not sure, but just from my observation, standing in that so same spot that you were at. Uh, I noticed, you know, the traffic stopped, somebody's revving it, and there's also th three or four police officers standing right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that would... We knock on the window. Yes, all over. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there may be some opportunities uh, to, to solve that one. Well, I think if we had the personnel, that's always my concern. We don't have the personnel or we're not utilizing them because we don't have this... Uh, uh, instrument for them to utilize right but if you have three or four officers that are standing on a corner and you have that happening in front of you that's a perfect opportunity to be able to say we have the personnel and we also have the the interest to do that because it is very um, tough for people down on the avenue to all of a sudden just be jarred as they're trying to eat because of somebody coming by and just blasting you know that, just blasting the, um, that that's you know. right and I think if a couple of people get a ticket you know the word gets around you got it. Um, Commissioner Boylston, did you have anything else? No, no. Okay, going down to this end. 
No, I mean, myself. I'm thrilled with this presentation because I feel like it's solving a lot of the problems we're concerned about. The tiering should do it. The conditional use will uh, not allow for the problem that we had that really brought us to this point. So I, what's the timeline? I'm mm -hmm. oh, sorry. I actually had a timeline in here and I took it out because I feel like I jinxed myself when I put okay, a timeline in. Okay, don't do it. My, my goal is, um, you know, end of the year, beginning of next Sooner year. Sooner than later. That's your time. We're on it. We're on it. But remember, you know, we're going to adopt it, but then we still have to get the right. um, decibel Equipment. readers. So, it, and it's, it's going to be a process, but mm -hmm. we're working on it. I just needed the direction. Anything else? No, thank you. Okay. Vice Mayor? Sure. Well, the good news is you won the presentation of the afternoon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I know. Well, I was hoping I gotta, I gotta to thank on Lynn a really for, bad note. <laughs> it was Lynn. It was Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> the award goes to Lynn. Um, and, no, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> Here's what I, I, the two words, proactive and objective, I wrote down. Yeah. Because I think that's very important. You know, everyone wants to maintain a vibrant downtown, mm -hmm. but no one wants to turn it into a Ocean Drive or Las Olas mm -hmm. or just out of control. Circus. And it's kind of, yeah, circus. Mm -hmm. You know what? That, that's a perfect word. Mm -hmm. No one wants a circus. Um, you know, one of the things I noticed with particularly some of the uh, louder places is some of their uh, neighbors that happen to be restaurants, people are dining and they don't want to listen to music. Mm -hmm. So it's hard, you know, there's different varying businesses up and down Atlantic Avenue that, you know, they have to work together. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think the timeline is great. I think the objective is great. I think what the plan is great. I think you all did a wonderful job. And the, the question I was going to ask is, are other cities doing it? What's the best practices? But you just answered it. Mm -hmm. You said that's what they're coming to. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're definitely looking at the best practices from the other cities, and we want to make sure that we're, you know, consistent. But, we, you know, uh, that's not going to hold us back. We, you know, we want to lead here. And, and the one, I think it was Ms. Cassell that brought up about the outdoor music, Johnny Brown's, and I see Mel here from Johnny Brown's representing. just wanted to recognize her. Um, I, I think you need to take them into consideration because they were here before anyone. Well, correct. They were downtown uh, in 2006, and I know they were here with the prior order. It was Elwood's. Yes, it was. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, you have to recognize that if you're open, I mean, you're going to be loud. So, and I think when we were talking about it, we were trying to figure out ways to address it um, while still being fair and consistent, right? So that's when we came up with, with this tiered approach to, uh, you know, to understand that there are certain venues. Now, going forward, they will be probably subject to a conditional use in order to, you know, for us at the front end to be able to limit the impacts. And there's always things that you can do. But, you know, I think from a fairness aspect, I, you know, there's no way that we could write this and then, you know, expect to enforce it against someone that's open air and, and not have pushback on that. And being considerate and working together mm -hmm. and everything that you, you brought out I think is spectacular. So mm -hmm. thank you all for the efforts and I think it's gonna make for a better uh, atmosphere all. Thanks. Yep, very good. Thank and you. I need to say one more thing before you do, yeah. Mayor. <laughs> I, I really appreciate this because you don't want your city to turn into a we can't handle this. The entertainment's bringing people all the way from Miami-Dade and other locations to come here. But it's the noise, I think, sometimes. And those who are paying the taxes every day are being abused. And we don't want to allow that to continue. And the fact that other cities are doing this is even more. Now, the businesses who were here before, um, be good neighbors, is yeah, my that's, my that's all we can ask. And education. We're going to have to educate everyone. We're not trying to pick on any particular one, but it's gotten a little out of control. And I'm sure you will direct in. us to do an educational campaign before enforcement begins, which I'm happy to do. And we're actually already thinking about marrying the city of the fact once the ordinance adopts it, the applicable training for police department code enforcement, and that, that would be the next step. So there is a training program imminent as a result of this direction. Very good. So okay. I, would, I would have to say that um, there's a couple of things that, uh, that I think that we definitely need to focus on. I agree when you're downtown and it's the height of the night on a Friday or a Saturday night, if you're not hearing Johnny Brown's, there's a problem. And that's the truth. I mean, then you would kind of, well, you would kind of be thinking something's wrong, you know, because that's really what is expected down there. However, um, the loud bursts of, of people revving their engines or um, cars without mufflers, uh, big motorcycle packs all without mufflers just driving down, sitting there it's, and revving, those are the types of things that we get more complaints about. I get complaints constantly from, the uh, the condo that's right at the 
bridge because there are, I guess, I guess that's where they really like to rev it up, going across that bridge. Um, so, you know, we may end up having to, if, um, and I'm hoping that this, this will help us to be able to do what is needed to do to control that. That's the biggest issue. And private parties. Um, we do get the occasional complaint from neighboring restaurants that are trying to have a nice restaurant experience for theirs, their people, uh, and, and then the band strikes up and everybody leaves and therefore now they're without. Um, and we could probably regulate that by just saying it has to be lower at a certain point, up to the 10 o'clock hour of dinner. Beyond that, it really does. That, it, that's what, what happens in the downtown. So if we, if they're not going to be able to do it, we could do that with this, um, it looks like, with this type of an ordinance. The only thing that kind of caught me, and I just want to ask you as a, from a legal standpoint, you were talking, in our study, it shows that there are these counts and what is expected and um, you know what is anticipated and how there's support for the noise. If we end up going to court at any given time, is that going to hurt us by, by saying that this is an expected you know, um, noise level and no? Okay. I don't think so. I think when you go to court, you know, it has to be, you know, f fair, reasonable, yeah. you know, those things, supportable. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why we're going through this. Okay. I don't know what those numbers are going to be yet. You right. Know, obviously, we're going to meet with Bennett. We're going to meet with staff and we'll get some type of understanding, which I did tell Bennett before we started the workshop that what I would like to do is once we agree on a number, I do want to test it. So yeah, sure. I want to go out to the to the neighborhood and so that, you know, when, when we're coming before you, you know, it's a situation yeah. where it's been tested and it, it seems like that's going to be the good range for everybody. But no, I think when you when you draft ordinances the way that we do them, where we hire the expert, we mm -hmm. collect the data, when you're doing that methodical way, I think that, that as long as you're not being arbitrary or not isolated down to that one. Correct. Yeah, gotcha. I think that's when you go to court and you're successful. Okay. When you come up with a number out of the blue, then yes, we're going to have a problem in court. Gotcha. Well, very good. You guys did a great job. Thank you very much for bringing this to us because I think thank it's really so going to be great. So thank you so much, Mr. Thank Bennett. Thank you. Pleasure. All right. So um, that concludes our commission workshop. Is there any other comments? Is anything? Yes. Okay, let's I have a quick, quick one. Uh, I see commission comments on yeah. here. I know. That's why I'm, I'm very disappointed. <laughs> We're going to put it there. Uh, comments. We are. Oh, listen see? to See? Comments. Oh. Oh, <laughs> very quickly. It's a quick one. I'd like to have all of us consider that. Oh, a no, we can't. I don't think we're allowed to do that. No, no, not, not There's to no vote. There's no voting. No voting. Okay. No voting. No voting. Just think about uh, provision to prohibit, prohibit the same app applicant from coming before the commission for the same project within a five-year period. Okay, so we'll discuss that maybe at the next meeting, but thank you. That'll give us all, all something to think about. Y'all, thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Meeting adjourned. That was a great comment. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Good note. I'm done. I'm done.